My whole life, I have viewed myself as a peaceful and rational man. Until now. You know the drill. Stay till the end to find out why this episode triggers cheaters. <clears throat> Smash the like button so hard. Google can't find it. I need to send a letter of thanks to Dyson. I discovered my wife, 49 female, of 17 years, having an 18-month affair, when I updated our fan filter on the app it uses. Here's some background. We've been married 17 years with no children of our own. She's been divorced once and had two daughters that I helped to raise, now 28 and 23, prior to our marriage. We've really only had minor bumps and issues, in my opinion. We've had an open-door type of communication with each other, whether it be work issues, venting, or intimacy issues, or just how we are feeling. Often, we will just talk on the couch about life and philosophy in general. I felt that we had a great connection and a pretty heavy, fulfilling bed life. We are both in great shape and maintain a healthy lifestyle. I work in the medical field and due to things being what they are, have been putting in a decent amount of overtime over the past five months. She works in a legal consultancy firm and has been working from home for the past five months, which has made things a bit distant, but on our days off, we are tight. So I changed the filter on the Dyson fan in our bedroom last night, then asked my wife if I could use her phone to update the app in order to reset the change filter alert. Mine was on the charger next to the front door, I noticed she had put on a pattern unlock and kind of wanted to ask her what that was about. As I was finding the app on her phone, a notification for Snapchat popped up. My stomach dropped immediately as I read the small tag. I'll bring the special toy, it said. My brain understood the words, but my mind just stopped functioning. She must have noticed, because she asked, what was the matter? after I guess several minutes of me just sitting and staring at the bedroom fan. My wife has an obligatory out-of-town meeting that puts her two states away for five days, every business quarter. I knew it was about this coming trip Monday. I've used Reddit for years anonymously. I've read hundreds of stories that began like this, and never once have I thought it being me that would sit on my bedroom floor and be in such a cold, dumbfounded state. I recovered and said, Oh, just getting info about the IPN router. That's how the fan communicates to the app. I have a Chromebook that she logged into Facebook yesterday. I took a week's vacation short notice. My supervisor is a cool chick, and once I laid out what I may have discovered and have to do, I'm going to need the time off. I've been up all night reading her chats. She left to go to the office just now, and I made sure the Google location history was on and find my phone was active. I am so suspicious of everything she does now. I can't look at myself in the mirror. She doesn't know I saw the message notification. I logged onto the messaging system that Verizon uses and have signed in under her number and my name. There are at least 15,000 that date back to February of last year. Messages, memes, flirty pics, and some X-rated ones too. She stopped texting him this way about three months ago didn't stop texting him, but stopped using the message app through Verizon. I'm guessing they switched to Snapchat because it's discreet. I'm not on any social media in any way, shape or form. I am clueless. I just figured out that you can't log into Snapchat through Facebook, but it just takes an email and password, and she has used our Chromebook to do that. Hell, she used it just three nights ago lying in bed next to me, rubbing my back while I went to sleep. She messaged him and snapped with him, lying next to me. I know who he is now. It's a younger man from work. He is married and has three young children. He and his wife have Facebook. I've met him twice, actually. Shook his hand. I'm at a complete loss again and have paced wandered around our house that I custom built for her. I almost can't feel anything. What little that I am processing is just white hot rage. I logged on Snapchat, and there it all was. I've called my best friend who has been divorced three times. Don't get me started on his partner picker. He recommended a vicious lawyer. I plan on recording, 
saving everything. There's pics of them doing it. I'm sure her phone or his has video. I desperately want this to be a bad dream. She said terrible things about me. She's told him my insecurities. She's told him, I love you. I can't find anything about them having long-term plans, so I think they haven't made any. So this feels like a purely physical relationship. It almost makes it better, but also makes it so much worse. Like she's literally throwing away our life for this. She knows cheating is an absolute deal-breaker for me. Our usual routine on the day she leaves for her meetings is I take her to the airport and drop her off with a long goodbye. I can't even think about what I have to do now. My friend tells me to print out the entire thing and see if I can recover anything from Snapchat. From what I understand, I can't unless I have her phone. My plan is to see the lawyer today. I'm paying a ridiculous amount to jump in her appointment line, get the ball rolling, and hopefully have a plan of action from her. I really want to book a flight and follow my wife to the hotel she's staying at and catch her in the act. I have access to her hotel booking options and have put myself as a contact person so I can get a room key without alerting her. I think I'm just going to log into the messaging apps when I get into town and watch it happen in real time. If I could get the papers ready in time, I'd hand them to her. Instead, I'm just going to hand her the printouts. It's a 600-page PDF. His wife accepted my friend request. I'm debating sending everything now. I am seething. I just don't want to lose any advantage. I'm going to fly there Monday afternoon, log in and see what they've talked about, get a room key to my wife's room and drop off the package in a room with my wedding ring. I'm going to sit in the bar and watch my phone blow up. I'm going to call the affair partner and tell him to meet me in the lobby or bar and to bring my wife down. Then tell him that a similar package has been sent certified mail to his home, addressed to his wife. As well as a Facebook message that I plan on hitting send on as I tell him. It feels petty and weak. I want to rage and scream, but I'm helpless. This morning, all I could do was give her a peck on the cheek goodbye. I really can't stand to look her in the eye. I somehow have to get through the weekend. I guess I'm asking, is my spiteful, hate-fueled plan worth it? I just want to inflict pain at this point. I want to hurt her emotionally. I feel eviscerated, emasculated. I will not entertain forgiveness or an apology. This is the one act that is unforgivable. It takes so many steps to cheat on someone. They all can be stopped until the sin is complete. Then it is done. Should I just confront her tonight or catch her? I don't think I'll update. I'm truly thinking about never using social media again and only being with a partner that has a similar outlook moving forward. I found the special toy. Keep in mind we have a chest full of these fun devices, but this one wasn't ours. It was already in her carry-on. It's one of those remote control vibrating eggs. The ones that can be controlled by an app, it looks expensive. I meet with the lawyer in 90 minutes. I met with the lawyer. She was actually kind and I dare say compassionate with me. She told me point blank that her job was to represent me in this fight for my future. And my job in all of this was to tell her the complete truth and not make her job harder than it has to be. I went to Kinko's and printed the file out. It cost over $530 for color because I wanted to have the pictures pop. Shout out to Chris at Kinko's for not making a scene when the nudes started coming out. He asked what it was all about, so I told him the truth. He was taken aback, but shook my hand and apologized. I went home and crashed for about three hours until around 19.30, when my loyal soon-to-be ex came home, which was the usual time. Lawyer said to forget any Hollywood confrontation in a hotel bar, that it would look pretty crazy and not be coming at all. So I'm sorry to all of those people that wanted the high drama. She's right, ultimately. There's two routes to take with divorce, contested or not contested. 
She said I would have to notify my soon-to-be ex-wife that I have retained counsel, and in order to proceed, my soon-to-be ex-wife would have to either contest the divorce, or we would go through mediation and file from there. So she got home about two hours ago. I asked her if there was anything going on that she wanted to talk about. She said nothing other than the election. She then asked, what was bothering me? I wanted to cry, but truthfully, I was cried out. I said I was curious as to why she had a remote control toy in her luggage. The look on her face was actually more telling than anything I've ever seen. She looked panicked, pale. She began to breathe faster, sweat. I asked why she would have something like that. Who had the code and the app to it? She stammered and the tears began. As I pulled out my three file folders worth of text exchanges, I asked if the affair partner's wife would have it. She cried and pleaded that she could explain. I said she had five minutes to do it. Of course she couldn't. I told her that my attorney told me to tell her. I also told her to leave. She screamed it was her house too. I calmly told her that maybe, but I would be notifying everyone about her affair and betrayal, that even the girls will know. Or she can leave now and find other living arrangements for the time being. Hell, she'll be at her work conference for a week. She was speechless. I calmly pulled up Facebook and showed her the affair partner's wife. I said, do you want me to tell her? Or are you going to do it right now? Tears and moaning and pleading with, I love yous. And it wasn't supposed to go this far. Then my favorite, you can't do this. I said, well, it looks like I'm doing it, as I sent the affair partner's wife a message with the file of their escapades on it. I prefaced it with apologies and a brief explanation. I haven't heard back from her. I leafed through the stacks of paper and started reading random excerpts out loud to my soon-to-be ex-wife. I just wish we could spend the day attached to each other. Just you inside of me. You feel so much more intense than any other woman I've ever been with. She is still sobbing and asked to talk about us. She says our marriage can withstand her mistake. I told her I would never forgive her, her word is worthless, and that she threw away the last 17 years. I'm still entertaining the whole tell HR thing, and I'm going to tell everyone about her decision to end our marriage by cheating. Thank you to everyone who responded. I feel bad I couldn't respond to all the PMs and responses. I have a therapy appointment scheduled Tuesday. I kind of feel extremely elated. I'm shaking and incredibly low right now. I kind of want to unalive. The house is pretty quiet, except for her crying and moaning. I told her not to come back after her trip, but she does. I'm currently sending friend requests and trying to get everyone on my page. I'm just going to send it out to everyone that way. I'm going to wait until the morning to call the girls. I raised them from when they were 11 and 6. They are women now, 28 and 23. I don't know what to tell them or how to handle them. Lawyer here. Do nothing here without legal advice. You have a high earning potential and a lot to lose by doing this wrong. I don't know your state, but get to the lawyer office before you do a single thing. Firstly, keep evidence. All the evidence you can. Secondly, if you can do it and you can't get to the lawyer ahead of time for their advice, hire a personal investigator to watch her. Do not go yourself. Do not confront. Do not get violent. These things will only harm you. Third, get professional lawyer advice. But no kids let her go to her travel thing and then ghost her. Make sure to get all your important papers out of the house, your evidence out of the house, a full accounting, and a credit report. Fourth, it's personal preference, but I would file and have her served as soon as she steps off the plane or out of the airport by a process server. She can come home to you off the grid and have your phone number changed so she can't find you. Lastly, don't be in contact with her without a voice recorder so long as you're in a single-party consent state. Then, and only then, tell the other spouse. It sounds harsh, but you need to think of you right now. Also, your lawyer may say not to. Once you're clear, go for it. Again, like you're doing, get legal advice and proceed. Under no circumstances, go to the city and confront her. It'll make you look like a violent nut. Oh, good Lord. 
You hold all the chips right now, all of them. It's going to be ugly, no matter how you go about it. But I think catching them red-handed is how I would go about it, provided you have the strength to remain cool for the whole thing. I would find a way to include his wife if possible. She most certainly has a right to know the truth. But whatever you do, protect yourself and your assets first. Get some rest. Think clearly about everything and execute the plan with purpose and determination. You'll fall apart later, but keep your demeanor during your operation. You also might want to think about simply delivering a copy of your evidence to the hotel with a note that says, I know, do not come home and block her number so you aren't tempted to talk to her when she inevitably blows up your phone. Brought to you by Royal AI. To those that kept saying, that's not how Snapchat works. Yes, you are correct. She had that running in the background. It was WhatsApp. I don't really give a flying rat. I saw it. I again need to thank Dyson for their app and the kick-ass fan I got from my brother-in-law for Christmas. Here it goes. I'm going to give a deeper background on our situation to help with some perspective on why I feel the way I do. My original post was pretty much a stream of consciousness and felt as disjointed as I did then. I went to college in Las Vegas in the mid-90s. I graduated in 99. I had a blast there. I got around. It was during this formative time, I decided to never marry. It was, is, an outdated concept that essentially removes your agency, and I definitely did not want children. When I graduated with my degree in nursing, I quickly excelled in cardiovascular intensive care. I moved home to Texas in 2001 and pursued my master's degree to be an advanced practice registered nurse, so a nurse practitioner with a specialization in CV surgery. While I was achieving this, I decided to pursue medical school and shifted coursework to fill in what I needed to apply. It was then that I met my soon-to-be ex-wife. She was a short, chubby, I believe the kids today would call this thick, red-headed firecracker. We met in a club. It was intense, both the attraction and the dating. We were saying, I love yous within three months. She was a mother of two that had been divorced for about two years. Remember, I wanted to be child-free. She was just getting out of an on-again, off-again relationship when we met. We dated for about two years, and she slowly introduced her daughters to me, eleven and six. She sat me down one night and gave me a pretty heartfelt but pragmatic talk about us, or where we were at the time, and what she needed, expected from me or any other partner. Essentially, she said it was time to either get married or move on. I was still pretty anti-marriage, and she respected that. She was telling me this to give me a chance to think about us and what the future looked like. She had a pretty good point in that we were living together, eight months at that point, and even had each other as persons to notify in an emergency. She joked that all that was missing was having each other on our insurance, it was a good honest talk, and we agreed that we would continue on for a bit more, but I would ultimately have to make the decision. Two weeks later, I had an acceptance letter to a medical school about two hours away. I was ecstatic and crushed at the same time. I had just had my 26th birthday and was about to accomplish a huge life goal. Then I realized I'd never see her or the girls. My self-doubt got the better of me. Being a medical student, then resident with a fellowship was going to be a roughly seven-year process. All the while, I could not make the money or support the lifestyle we had grown accustomed to. I thought about the prospect of at least seven years of loans, debt and work and losing her, so I declined and switched back to a master's in nursing administration. We got married in July of 2003. It was an intimate and personal ceremony with just immediate family and friends. While my parents adore the girls, rightly so, they've always been standoffish with my wife. On Monday, when I told my parents what was happening, and that there was a real possibility the girls could stop being as prevalent in their life as they have been, they told me that they still felt that soon-to-be ex-wife was damaged goods being married prior to, and forcing me to compromise. That really hit home, 
and to a certain extent, they were correct. After I graduated, I didn't want to be a manager or director. I'm a hands-on guy that likes taking care of patients. The hospital I was at offered a certification in Exmo and a perfusionist credential. It was a highly competitive application, but I got in. For the past 11 years, I have been doing ECMO and all things related. I have had a blast, and it has been challenging, as well as heartbreaking at times. My wife decided about five years ago that being a registered nurse on the floor had run its course, and she wanted a more nine-to-five job that did not involve patience or drama. She got on through a friend at a multi-state legal consultancy that specializes in medical legal suits, she abstracts data from patients' charts and presents it in the manner requested. So that's the setup. Now you have a picture of my background. Let's get back to D-Day. On Saturday morning, D-Day plus two, I only slept a few hours. I had dark, disturbing thoughts regarding my future and life. I had thoughts and scenarios of unaliving and violence upon them and myself. I was in the kitchen making breakfast, eggs and toast when she walked into the kitchen, still bleary-eyed. She asked if I would make her some. I threw it in the trash in front of her. I then proceeded to load up my record player and play music from my youth at an uncomfortable volume to prevent her from trying to talk to me. Real mature, I know. I began pain shopping, big time, reading the printout in chronological order. I do, and I don't recommend it. By the afternoon, I was done with Black Fang and Danzig. I was listening to Torch breakup songs by Chris Isaac. She approached me again. This time, she was almost resentful, asking what purpose notifying the affair partner's wife served. I stared at her for what felt like an inappropriate amount of time, a bit dumbfounded. I told her point blank that at least she, AP's wife, would get the chance to make an informed decision about her future instead of compromising and sacrificing for someone that would betray them so selfishly. I guess my message to AP's wife was received, and things were not good for him. She sat down on the couch and began to tear up and sob. I told her I was cried out, and more correctly, I was so numb that I will do that later, when I am done doing what needs to be done. She asked timidly, all indignation and bravado gone from her voice, what else I had to do? I told her, to ruin your life and give you the pain I have now. I told her that if she had any respect for me or love me, she would open her phone and show me everything. She refused and said it didn't matter, and all I would do is hold it against her. I said there was a part of me, the completionist in me, that wanted to know. She refused again and went to the guest bedroom. I found her HR new hire paperwork from her company, they have a corporate compliance line and I called, and left a detailed message. They, soon to be ex-wife and her affair partner, had discussed client information that also had protected health information with an unsecured, non-approved messaging system. I also informed them that she was his acting supervisor on two projects over a certain time. That corresponds with the inappropriate messages. Lastly, I said that they both used their subsidized phones to transmit graphic materials, pics, texts, and videos. That was a big no-no as well. My whole life, I have viewed myself as a peaceful and rational man. This has broken that part of me. I don't know where all of this anger has come from. I am somewhat worried. Like, will it stop? I know in the long run, to get over this, I will have to accept her apology and forgive her for her mistakes. I just don't know if I'm capable, and it is worrying to me. That evening, I continued to notify family and friends of the situation and her actions. I called a physician friend and requested a favor for a checkup and an STD check. He had questions, I answered. My eyes got heavy around eight. Sunday, D-Day, plus three. I decided to drive to see the girls. They're about three hours away. The youngest is still in college for another semester, maybe longer, thanks 2020. I've been having pretty extreme feelings about them since this began. I've formed a respectful, friendly relationship with them, but not much of a fatherly one. The oldest, especially. We are cordial, but there's always that you're not my dad vibe between us. 
The youngest, not so much, but when they are together, it gets more prevalent. I left early Sunday around 5 a.m., arrived at their condo. Their father paid around 850 for it. I prepared kolaches and good coffee for them. They were immediately worried about their mother before I said anything. I told them point blank about the situation and that their mother would probably be moving in the next three, six months. I can honestly say it was best to do and say this in person. I told them everything. They were disappointed in her. I then told them that I wasn't there to get them to take a side, but they were adults in a special circumstance within our relationship, and if they decided they didn't want to interact or have a relationship with me, that was okay. I would be somewhat let down, but also relieved. I told them, however, that our relationship, or lack thereof, should not interfere with their grandparents, my parents. They both agreed that they would definitely like to keep in touch with their grandparents. I left there around 11 and headed home. I stopped at my best friend's house, and a couple of tears rolled down my face. I had essentially helped to raise them as best I could. Their father was absent most of their childhood and started another family six hours away. My best friend decided that I had drank enough the past 72 hours and I needed to sleep. I crashed at his place that night. I had noticed my cheating wife had been blowing up my phone after I left the girl's place. Oh well, I was too tired and in too dark a place to care. Monday, D-Day plus four. I arrived home around eight and noticed her Porsche was still there. I thought for a moment that she'd Ubered to the airport. No, no, she had not. She was up and had breakfast made. She asked me to sit down and eat with her. I did. She asked how it tasted. I told her like static. I told her I've had a hard time tasting and feeling anything other than bitterness and anger for the past five days. She had called in sick at work and didn't leave for her quarterly meeting. She tried to start talking about how worried she was for me and that she loved me so much. She had gotten a call from her oldest yesterday around noon and they were deeply disturbed by her behavior. I laughed. As I did it, I realized it was not a funny laugh. It had a manic kind of feel to it and took me aback. I said, oh, you love me so much. You have a year and a half affair behind my back. You love me so much. You jumped some other married man. You love me so much. You pissed away nearly half of my life. She had never given me a reason as to why she did it. I told her that and it made it so much worse. I went to the liquor cabinet and pulled out a bottle. The bottle was an 18-year Glen Fittage that my grandfather bought for us when we got married. It has been, was, our tradition to have a small sip on our anniversary night. And remember that things get better with time and patience. I chugged the remainder of it. It was about a third of the bottle that was left. I said, sorry, I didn't offer you any, as you don't deserve it. I went to the bedroom and began pulling all of the pictures off of the wall that had us or her in them. I placed them on the kitchen table. She had left. My attorney called to notify me that the petition for divorce was ready and I needed to sign off on it before it could be filed and my wife would be served within ten business days. I read it quickly while being buzzed on premium scotch. E-signed and pressed send. I also got a message from the affair partner's wife she reluctantly thanked me for this horrible but good revelation. She declined to speak with me, but wanted to message me to tell me. She found texts and videos with other women besides my wife. She kicked him out and was going to an attorney soon. They live in California, so you know he's royally screwed. I proceeded to listen to music and have a few more drinks. I fell asleep around four in the afternoon. I heard her come home around ten. She saw the pile of pictures and things that had at one time meant something to us. She began sobbing and asking me to talk to her. I only asked one question. Why? She kept saying she didn't know. I called her vile things and said that she made so many decisions to get to just the first text. It was she that started it. I was pretty loose with my tongue due to being drunk. I laughed at her and started taking off my clothes and said, You threw away this pointing to my body. I'm going to cringe some of you, but I'm six foot four and weigh just over 200 pounds. Up until last week, I still jogged and lifted weights four times a week. 
for some pot-bellied wiener needle guy. That wasn't going to do anything for her. I went to my room and had a shower. When I got out, she was on the bed, laying there seductively. She had lit some candles and begged me to take her. I turned on my camera and told her to repeat what she said. I thank everyone who mentioned doing this, just in case. For whatever reason, my erection did not do a good job of convincing her that I didn't want it. So I did it. I was not kind nor loving. I put her in uncomfortable positions and went Donkey Kong on her. I told her I wanted to do certain things I never asked before, and I wanted to hear her beg me for it. I recorded it all with her consent. I felt so many mixed emotions as I really loved her, but I'm indifferent to her now. I hate her. I think nothing of her. I want her and feel like I need her, but it hurts me to think of us anymore. We fell asleep together. I woke up kind of hungover and had a hard time looking at myself in the mirror. Tuesday, D-Day, plus five. Therapy was a two and a half hour session. Unbeknownst to me, she followed me there and wanted to know what I was doing. I told her I was getting some therapy for the emotional trauma I had after realizing I had thrown away most of my life on someone who couldn't even give me a reason as to why she would cheat on me. I was a loud and teary-eyed. My new therapist saw most of the exchange. I called her horrible names and told her I wished her dead. Needless to say, my session was intense. He prescribed some sedatives for me, and I had another shorter appointment scheduled on Thursday. We discussed my anger and betrayal, my emasculation, my fear of the future. I explained I am terrified of the unknown. Last week, I felt like a complete man. I had a vision and goals. I also had a partner to deal with any issues and obstacles. Now, I am a ship without a rudder or mast. I feel no sense of direction or power or means to get away from this. He started explaining the why that I wanted to know. It isn't a single question. It is a series of questions that is pretty interesting. I suppose you can apply it to any behavior that you want to explain the motivation behind it. He said that instead, I should calmly ask my soon-to-be ex-wife what within herself gave her permission to do this to me. There were several more to follow up with, but this is what stuck out the most. I told him about our last intimate encounters. He recommended that I lay out explicit ground rules regarding our physical relationship. He ultimately recommended that I don't do it anymore. It would confuse and exacerbate things tremendously unless reconciliation was my goal. I cried. I raged. I left exhausted. Soon-to-be ex-wife was still outside waiting for me. I walked past her and didn't respond to her questions and pleading. I got a call from the physician's office to get tested and went to that appointment. I told him the short version. He recommended to stop drinking and take the sedatives cautiously. I went home and proceeded to continue removing my things from the house and boxing them up. I have decided I would move out. I called work and requested a face-to-face -face meeting. The thought of working or concentrating on legitimate life and death issues is not possible in my current state of mind. I drove to the administrative building at the hospital, met with the team and formally gave my six weeks resignation. I have such a niche, specialized job that six weeks is kind of a minimum courtesy. I put it succinctly that my soon-to-be ex-wife's actions had caused a stressful home life and I would be a detriment to patients, the team, and myself if I continued to remain in this area. I have decided to move away, far away. I got home after picking up some groceries. It has been about a week since I have had more than a mouthful of food and have existed on liquor and not much else. I took both my therapist's and physician's friend's advice and decided to make some food and stop drinking. She was home, sitting in the darkened living room, drinking wine. She had organized the pictures and was looking through them. She had put on makeup and was wearing a date night dress. She had been crying a lot. Her makeup was in bad shape. She got up and tried to embrace me. I pushed her gently away and pulled out my phone and hitting record. She started crying again. She told me the affair partner's wife had called her and told her that he had had other women as well as her. She said that she was so much the fool 
and every derogatory name I had called her was right. She begged me to reconsider us. I said, why bother? She didn't when she betrayed me. I told her I was sorry that her lies flushed her out, but I felt that she was sorry that she got caught, not remorseful for what she did to me. I told her I felt she was sorry that she was going to have to start over, and then she was more upset about that than losing any love she had for me. I said that she abandoned her love for me or us two years ago, when she decided to cheat. I kept piling it on her. I informed her of my call to the corporate compliance line and the specific rules she broke. I didn't raise my voice or act angry. I was shaking a bit, but it was like everything was leaving me in a rush. I felt elated and so low at the same time. I felt empty when I was done. I put up the few groceries I had bought and made a small sandwich, then went to bed. She was there again. I pulled out my phone and told her, with the recorder going, what my therapist had talked about in regards to our encounters in bed. Keep in mind, in 17 years, I cannot recall one time when I've refused or declined any intimacy from her. I asked her to leave and sleep in the guest bedroom. She refused. I said, fine, I would then. Wednesday, D-Day, plus six. I woke up and she was curled up next to me. I removed myself and did some light exercises. I've been working on my resume and getting applications out. I might be working in Seattle by the end of the year. I love my parents and will miss being 20 minutes away from them, especially as they are becoming elderly. I can't stay in this city. The thought of running into her after this is over is not something I want to entertain. I want to be free and have no reminders of my sense of loss and my lifetime of compromise. It was a pretty blank day and it rained off and on for most of it. I met up with my best friend and gave him a rundown over an early dinner. We decided not to drink. My attorney said that me moving away will not affect the outcome of the financials. I'm going to live off my PTO until the end of October and use my half of our liquid savings to relocate and settle. I feel empty and I'm trying to laugh at his funny jokes, but it's an effort. I keep finding myself in a deep emptiness that has such a powerful pull. I have never thought about unaliving, but for the past few days and nights, I've had daydreams of what it would be like if I wasn't here. I'm going to tell my therapist tomorrow. I've been going to the library and reading relationship books. I've been reading Chump Lady. It's great stuff. She got a call from her work. I eavesdropped on a small portion of it, but I know she has a meeting tomorrow, despite her claiming to be sick. She was in bed again, just like the past few nights. I am so conflicted. I just want to feel something, but I feel so little but hate and resentment for her that the only intimacy I want is of the sadistic kind. I'll admit that during one we had Monday, I felt almost a runner's high, but there was a crash, and the next day I was angry at myself. I am doubting myself a small amount in regards to not wanting her back. I know she messed up huge, but I don't know if I can forget it or forgive it. I am a tangled mess. I told her the ground rules with my phone recording in regard to these moments we have. I told her that it did not indicate reconciliation or some covert signal that I wanted that. I told her this is probably hysterical bonding and not healthy. I told her that I wasn't going to be gentle or care about her feelings or needs during it. She was teary-eyed and nodded understanding. She quietly said that she deserved it. She then rolled over and got on all fours. Thursday, D-Day, plus seven. I woke up with her spooning me. I laid there for a while and heard her breathing change pattern. I could feel her looking at me. I asked with my back turned to her what her meeting was going to be about. She said it was an HR representative and it was probably going to be bad. She asked what she could do to make us right or equal again. I said nothing. She offered an open marriage on my end. She would not pursue anyone, but I could. I chuckled. No, I don't trust you. She said that was fair. We had this conversation with my back to her. It was easier than looking at her. I get mad when I see her face. I asked what I did in this marriage that made her so unhappy. She did this. She said I was beyond great. I chuckled again. Well, obviously that doesn't matter. She said it was an adventure like she lived off of the rush. She didn't realize until it was too late 
or thought if she got caught or something went wrong, everyone would be hurt. She said it was a huge relief and an unforgettable pain when I confronted her. I got up and made us breakfast. I went to my therapist and told him my plan with work and already had responses to my applications. I told him everything about my wife and what we were doing in the meantime. We discussed my negative thoughts and talked about the process involved with them. Again, he wasn't judging. He just wanted me to not get confused or if I did not understand to stop and process. It was only a one hour and 55 minute session and I felt that weird calm again. Like nothing matters for now, everything just is. When I got home, she was sitting in the living room. She told me that she was fired for breach of protocol with client information and violation of the data security protocols. I said, oh, that's too bad. I exercised and made a nice dinner. She joined me. We didn't say much. While we were sitting in the living room, she told me that her affair partner had been fired as well. I said, good. She told me she has had no contact with him in five days. I asked why not. They were both free now. She could fly out to her soulmate and have all the fun they wanted now. She said I was the only one she wanted. I said, no, you had all of me and it still wasn't enough. I told her that in nearly 20 years of work and our relationship, I'd been approached and hit on too many times to count. I managed to not fall in love or use any other excuse. Now I am so bitter and angry because of the compromises I made. She asked what compromises. I told her, me wanting to go to medical school but decided to get married and be stable. Me not wanting children but because they were a part of her, I accepted them and compromised. I said I made those compromises for our love, but obviously I had misplaced my trust and love in her. I told her that if I could go back in time, I would tell 26-year-old me to pass her up and leave it be for the streets. She asked again what she could do to bring us back together. I told her that I will not ever compromise for her again, and that means we really can't have a healthy relationship. I told her I would never love her again, and that at best, I would treat her like a toy I'll take and disregard any time. Otherwise, she wouldn't factor into my plans or thoughts. I told her it was just a week ago. She was the first person I thought of when I woke up and the last person I thought about when I went to sleep. Now, it hurts too much to think about her. I'm going to walk away from this. I feel like it is starting to constantly remind me of things. I cannot thank those kind people I could chat with and who shared their pain and stories that have helped me. This has been on a whole a good thing for me to do, but I keep replaying things and feelings I'd rather just walk away from. I remain confused about what I want. I don't know if I will ever be 100% about anything with her ever again. I have bi-weekly appointments for the next four years with my therapist. Sorry, good people. My inner Hemingway is not back. I'm afraid this isn't going to be nearly as tawdry or visceral as my beginning of this beautiful disaster. Well, it's been an interesting five weeks. I've discovered more about the affair. I moved out about three days after my last update. My wife constantly texts and leaves notes on my apartment door and car. I told my lawyer, who offered to write her a stern cease and desist letter. I'm contemplating it. My therapist has complimented me on my progress and is confident I can manage the anger, despair and depression I initially felt. I agree. My wife and I had an encounter like I mentioned before one last time the night before I moved out. I told her again, in no uncertain terms it meant nothing and would not make me change my mind about reconciliation. She said she understood, but with the constant attempts to communicate, I'm not convinced. She was served notice of the filing for divorce petition the first week of October. The love bombing and attempted hoovering has been borderline psychotic. The earliest hearing is expected to be in January. If she stays true to her word, it will be quick. If she wants to fight, fine. She got another job about a week after she was fired. It goes to show you it's who you know. Anyway, I'm good.
I've acknowledged her shortcomings as a person and as a spouse. I told her I'd never forgive her. I merely accept it, happened, and live my life from there. I had two unexpected surprises over the last three weeks. My stepdaughters came to visit me. I told them point blank that if their mother put them up that they didn't need to do it. The oldest insisted. It turns out they had had a lengthy discussion with their mother regarding this sordid affair, and our relationship came up for discussion. My oldest stepdaughter had always carried a huge chip on her shoulder when it came to me. Well, she apologized for that. It turns out that her assumptions about me were incorrect. When I was introduced to them, my wife and I had been dating for about four months. There was definitely overlap with the on and off guy. And before we dated, she had been in an on and off relationship with a man my stepdaughters hadn't met. My wife's first husband had cheated on her and she tried to reconcile. They did for about a year. Then she decided to have a revenge affair. Enter on again, off again guy. Well, my stepdaughters thought I was that guy. Their father spent most of their lives bad talking their mother for cheating, but also never disclosed to them that he had cheated as well. So long story short, my oldest stepdaughter apologized and asked for forgiveness due to all the issues she caused. That was a messed up weekend. Again, showing the effects of infidelity and dishonesty. I wish to address the accusatory statements about the darker encounters my wife has requested while I was making preparations to leave. This is where it's good to explain that she has always been into BDSM. I was not all that into it. The whole point of it was that I did not provide aftercare for her. Hell, I took classes and attended a workshop on being a so-called dom. I did it to make her happy. I am done making her happy. She lost that privilege. She lost my respect as well, something that is pretty much the end of a marriage. Surprise, too, came from out of nowhere. It was a long-time co-worker. She works in another department. I've decided to stay as a PRN worker. Well, needless to say, it's been interesting. She found out about my pending divorce and all the gossip in the hospital. I've taken to wearing my wedding ring on a chain now. I told her after she insisted she'd take me out for a drink that I, one way or another, wouldn't be around for a lot longer and had zero interest in any type of relationship. She just smiled and squeezed my hand, then told me that she had no intention to be with me forever. She just wanted to have fun together. She's been spending the night a couple times a week, and it is something I've enjoyed. She even helped me pack my carry-on and drop me off and pick me up at the airport for my interview in Seattle. I crushed that interview. I got a call from a travel agency that also had numerous opportunities for me, I kind of like the option of the travel gig and just crashing at my parents between contracts. I'm not certain of what I want to do. It's oddly terrifying to not be responsible for another person and be this liberated basically instantly. My lawyer said that there is no alimony nor spousal support. She also said that it's a no-fault state, so infidelity doesn't affect the actual divorce. However, infidelity with proof does affect the division of assets. She said it might even swing up to 70, 30, in my favor. The sale of the house is inevitable. I asked a realtor to run comps, and it will be a substantial amount. Not enough to justify 17 years down the drain. For now, I'm contemplating a three-month European tour. I'm feeling fairly positive again. I'm not in the best of places, but definitely not as bad as I could be. Thank you, Redditors. Some of y'all's chats were amazing, coupled with therapy. This is my last update. I'm going back to lurking anonymously. I hope I never have to post again. I read your story again. I remembered it. I think worse than the cheating was the fact that she was mocking you and your insecurities to the AP. I never read anything about you confronting her with it. I think it is just pure evil and disgusting to do that. And then tell you how much she loved you. Also, the fact that she actually apologised when she found out that she was one of the many women the AP was seeing. That is when it rang to her that he was just using her for fun and that he would never be exclusive with her. So then she wanted you back like crazy. 
Such a disgusting woman. I am glad you managed to get yourself rid of her. I wish you all the best in the future and hope to never see you back posting here. She really got off on the double life and secrecy. It was like she was pulling something over on me, and it was a rush for her. I feel that she is remorseful as one can be, but nothing will undo this, and I won't ever forgive it. Maybe on her deathbed, but typing it down makes me think I even wouldn't then. She has ruined a lot of things for herself. Some long-time dear friends have essentially disowned her. My closest friend at work, his son had his bar mitzvah, and she was politely uninvited. There were other events this month that really showed the loss she's going through. This story was just wow. I commend you on your strength and for not judging yourself too much when you weren't strong. Real stories like this help others find their strength when it happens to them. Also, you are a great writer. Maybe you should start writing articles or keep a blog. Could be medically related. Finally, good luck on starting your new life. I don't think you'll have any trouble finding something better with your personality. Live your life. Remember, their choices have nothing to do with your worth. And don't hold future lovers accountable for what your messed up ex did to you. She's had enough of a negative influence on your life. Best of luck. Thank you. It's funny, I guess not funny, that you mention the issue with the future lovers. The woman who has been rocking my world has had a similar experience. And we have definitely had some intense talks about issues with partners moving forward. I'm probably going to pursue more therapy, related to the trust issues I can already feel manifesting. Thank you for the good life advice. Brought to you by Royal A. I'm the Dyson fan guy. I had to delete that account because I kind of got internet infamous, and it sort of got a little close to home. Plus, the literal thousands of messages and chat requests were too much to process. When does the timer reset on your own relationship clock to begin again after a traumatic ending of a lifelong commitment? I've read lots of articles and relationship blogs, and the time span is incredibly variable, from six months to six years. I know fundamentally I'm not the damaged one. Damage was done to me. I have engaged briefly in therapy to mitigate the initial trauma, and I feel it was essential in my rapid return to normal. I've engaged in the drawn-out divorce my cheating wife promised she wouldn't provide. I'm doing phenomenally well. To get to the point, I met someone on Reddit, and she had some similar issues within her marriage. We've hit it off and have begun the process of building a LTR. We're going on five-plus months. One thing this entire fiasco has enlightened me to is that life is too short to wait. If there is someone that is good and good for you, go for them. Give them your all. Give them your best. It makes you a better person. Even if it doesn't work out, you are better for not holding back. I feel good, not just in the relationship, but within myself and my life. Granted, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think of my marriage and all of its issues, along with the trauma of infidelity. To me, this will be an occurrence for the foreseeable future, until one day it isn't. I have insecurities, so does she who doesn't, and we respect them and help one another when they are interfering with our thinking and feeling. Right now, I'm lying on the couch with her, discussing our plans for this weekend. We are watching the cats play fight, and I just made her an iced coffee. It's the most comfortable and welcoming interaction I can recall in a long time. It just feels right and good. I guess this is just as much an update as a request for advice. That brings us to the end of this story. This month and March, the uploads will be less frequent as I'm unable to upload more episodes for you all. My apologies for this, but don't be sad, my loyal viewers. I'll make up for it. I promise. Thank you for staying till the end. You're the one I make these episodes for. Don't forget to smack the like button into oblivion. If you have a good story you're willing to share, email it to contactroyalai at gmail.com. See you 
in the next one.